Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 25, please, and sit back and watch this uh, just a short little uh, film, if you would, and we're going to talk about waiting for Christmas. days we will be celebrating the birthday of our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the, that fact, I think, brings with it a great season of celebration, doesn't it? Yeah. And uh, I'm glad that we get a full month or so. Sometimes, uh, you know, they start out putting out Christmas decorations now, or at least in the stores, what, about September or so, or whatever, but uh, August. Yeah, August now. Uh, and uh, <laughs> But, you know, we get to celebrate both before and even a little bit after the, uh, the great day where we talk about our Lord's uh, uh, birth. And, uh, you know, all of you are probably aware of Luke chapter 2 or the chapter we're in this morning. And it gives us, uh, this chapter of the Bible gives us more details about the, the birth of Jesus Christ than any other place in the scriptures, right? And it tells us a lot about what was going on in the, in the, uh, uh, in the culture and in the society and about them having to go to... Uh, to Bethlehem in order to, because of the taxes that had been levied by the government and so forth. And in that, uh, those first 24 verses of this chapter, we're introduced to uh, most of the main characters of the Christmas uh, pageant story. We, of course, have Mary, uh, who's pregnant with this baby, and Joseph, and, and then uh, the little baby Jesus is, is born. Uh, we have shepherds, we have angels, we have the sheep, and by the way, that's the only uh, real animal mentioned in the in the Bible about the Christmas story uh, uh, there, but uh, uh, we have all of these individuals that stand out in that traditional Christmas story, right? And we're all aware of those, and perhaps I'm not sure what the drama is going to be about. We may see a little bit of that uh, next week as we, we come to, to that uh, service. But this morning, I'd like to take a look at Two other people that uh, who, while they were not present at Jesus' birth, they were waiting with great anticipation, great expectation for his coming. They could not wait, you see, for that day to finally arrive. Now, the fact is, most of us are not very good at waiting, are we? Do we have any good waiters in here? <laughs> Uh, we don't like to wait. I, I don't like waiting for my laptop to update and uh, and reboot. Do you? I hate that. It, 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 this morning, it took it 20 minutes to uh, when I got here to church. I don't like waiting in traffic. No, nope, anybody? Uh, I don't like waiting in line at Walmart or Publix or Lowe's or the post office. For this time of the year, you may have to what? Wait. I don't like going to the doctor and being told to go sit in the waiting room. Why don't they change the name? We could come up with a better name than that, don't you think? And, and then once they call your name to go in, you know, uh, they take you to another even smaller little room with uh, no windows. And the nurse says, have a seat and wait 
here for the what? For the doctor to come in. Uh, how many of you like that? No, no, you know, uh, it's hard to wait, isn't it? And, and it's especially hard to wait on God in our lives. I've come to realize that while we're always in a hurry in our generation, in our society, God isn't in a particular hurry. <laughs> We want things to happen now, if not a little bit sooner than that. And God, however, t seems to take his time, doesn't he? Some people say, well, I've, I've waited long enough for God. I, I don't see anything good coming out of all of this waiting that he's making me do. We pray, and then we wait, and then we, uh, you know, we're, we're longing for something to take place, and we have to wait. And, and while all this waiting on the Lord and waiting in lines is difficult, what we need to realize is that God is working out his perfect will through the waiting process. Take, for example, the miracle of birth, of childbirth. There's nothing quite like waiting for the arrival of a baby to come into your home and your family. But even while the expectant mother waits, God is at work forming and shaping that baby's life inside of her womb. You see, conception is the promise, but delivery and birth are the fulfillment of that promise. And But between the promise and between the fulfillment, there are nine months of what? Waiting. Waiting. Expecting, we call it. How many of you ladies have ever been expecting? All right. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about much better than I would do. And, and along with that expecting comes some months of dis discomfort, Right. And uncertainty and a little bit of anxiety and wondering as well. You see, waiting is hard, and frankly, most of us aren't very good at it, are we? 700 years, did you get that? 700 years before the birth of Jesus, the Lord had spoken through a Jewish prophet named Micah. His words in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, had stirred the imaginations of the people of Israel for, for those seven centuries. Can you turn the mic down just a little bit, Jason? Let's get a little feedback here somewhere. And, and, and remember what, what Micah said in that, in that short little verse in chapter 5, verse 2. He says, but thou Bethlehem, he mentions Bethlehem by name, though thou be little among the thousands of, of towns in, in Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth Unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. 700 years of what? Of waiting. Waiting for Christmas. Waiting for that day when he finally would arrive. And before I go any further, let's read the scripture and then let me ask you a few questions, all right? Verse 25 of Luke chapter 2, if you're with me there this morning, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. It says this, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was, what, Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death, before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he up in him in his arms, and he blessed God. And notice what he said in verse 29 through verse 32. Here's what he said. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Well, verse 33 explains that Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through my, thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Verse 36, it says, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. 
And she was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she, coming in that instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned unto Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Let's pray together. Father, thank you this morning for the reading of the Word of God. Thank you for the scriptures that remind us of the events that took place both before and after the birth of your dear son. And this morning, Lord, as we talk about this this thought of just waiting for Christmas, I pray that today you would speak to our hearts, Lord, and move in our spirits. Speak to us like you spoke, much like you spoke to Simeon. And you moved upon him. Dear God, I pray that you would move in this spirit, in this, in this service, uh, by your Holy Spirit. That you would touch our hearts, Lord. Meet our needs, Lord. Take that person that's lonely, Lord, and, and become their friend this morning. And may they look to you. God, take that person that's discouraged and encourage them. Lord, take that person that's lost and save them. Lord, take that person who's backslidden and call them back to yourself. Dear God, we want you to have your will, your way, and have it done here in our hearts in the midst of this service, of this hour, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask you a few questions. Are you looking forward to anything special this Christmas? What are you expecting to receive at this Christmas season? What are you waiting for during the Christmas time? You see, in Luke's Gospel, we come across two people who made their appearance in the final act of the Christmas drama. One is a man named Simeon, the other a woman named Anna. They don't appear in any nativity scenes that you might see, or in many Christmas cards, or any Christmas cards for that matter, but they're very significant players in the role that God has for them. Both of these individuals, you see, were they were longing with great anticipation, with great excitement and expectation to finally see the coming Messiah. But the promise and the fulfillment were far apart in their lives. And so they waited, looking forward to God's promised Redeemer to finally arrive. Now, there are four words that I want you to make note of this morning. If you've got your notes out there, it's on the back of your prayer list. I want you to write down these four words, if you would, this morning, or put them in the the flyleaf there of your Bible, the next in the margin. The first word is the word anticipation. We've already kind of mentioned that a few times, anticipation. The second word is revelation. Revelation. The third word is consolation. It's found in verse 25. And the last word, the thought there that's in this text is what I would call jubilation. Anticipation, revelation, consolation, jubilation. They're all here wrapped up in this story we've just read. Now, for instance, Luke uses a Greek word uh, of anticipation that identifies them as waiting with with great expectation for the Savior. It's found there in uh, verse 25. Let's read it again. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout. What was he doing? He's waiting. He's waiting for something. Waiting for, it says here, the consolation of Israel and the Holy Ghost was upon him. That's that word. It's a word that means to to be alert to his appearance, to be ready to welcome him, to wait with patience, to wait wait with expectation for something to happen. We see the same word used in verse 38. It's in a phrase there uh, talking about Anna. It says, And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to, to all of them that looked for, notice that phrase, that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And that word looked for is this word anticipated. They, they eagerly awaited or expected him to come. 
And so that word that, that kind of reminds us that, listen, we ought to be in expectation. We ought to be anticipating what God is going to or what he wants to do in our lives. I tell people often, when you come to church, you ought to come expectantly. Amen. You ought to come expecting for God to touch your heart, to, to, te- to talk to you, to speak to you, to show you, uh, to help you in whatever it is you're, you're struggling with. We're introduced here to Simeon there in verse 25, and Simeon was a righteous man, the Bible says. He was devout in his relationship with the Lord, and and the word consolation that he uses there in verse 25, and that's our second word, the word consolation means to give comfort to someone who is sad or disappointed. It, It really is a word that means to provide hope in the midst of a hopeless situation. I can tell you when Jesus came, he brought something with him. Amen. He brought hope. Amen. For the world. He is the hope of the world. Simeon was anticipating the coming of the one who was going to bring that hope to his heart and to his people. He was waiting, you see, for, he calls it the consolation of Israel, but it's a word that means the comfort. He he was waiting for for someone to come alongside him, someone to, to deliver his people, someone to save his nation. And i tell you, things weren't going so well in Israel in those days. Things were pretty bleak. They hadn't heard from God in for many years. They were under Roman rule of a a foreign nation was in charge of them. They had lost their political independence. They were living in fear under the rule of a Roman-appointed king named Herod, who was kind of a cruel, evil man. And many were wondering if Messiah would ever come. Will he ever make an appearance? The verse 26 shows that Simeon had good reason for his hope. He had good reason for his anticipation. What was it? Well, it's called revelation. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. In other words, God had told Simeon, look, you're not going to die until the Messiah comes. You're going to see him before you go on uh, to heaven. And so he had been eagerly awaiting. He's probably a little old by now, don't you think? Mm-hmm. He's probably gotten to his, his elder years, and, and Jesus still hadn't come. The Messiah still hadn't made it. But yet he's still waiting and looking and longing and expecting Jesus to come at any time. And, and, and here's a day uh, uh, when, he, when he, 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 he's, he's focused on the fact that he's going to come one day. Simeon's expectation focused on the comfort, the salvation and the glory that Christ would bring. Notice he talks about salvation down in verse, verse 30. He says, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. By the way, one of the, among, among the Jews of Simeon's day, one of the most popular titles for the Messiah was that of comforter. Remember, Jesus said, when I leave, I'm going to send you another comforter who's the Holy Spirit. But Jesus was the first comforter. Did you know that? Uh-huh. All right. Strikes me. That the desire to be comforted, the desire to be cared for is a universal need of people. We all struggle, you see, at times with loneliness, emptiness, insecurity, sometimes despair. Many people live with a sense of hopelessness about their existence and their future. In fact, the Christmas season, as you know, is one of the major crisis times of the year for depression and for even suicide. Why? Because people need a comforter. They need someone that's there for them, that comes to rescue them, to save them, to help them, to deliver them. That's what Simeon was looking for. That's what he was waiting for. And on this day, the Holy Spirit prompted Simeon to go to the temple courts at just the right time when Joseph and Mary had, were bringing their newborn infant to the temple. And when Simeon looked at that baby Jesus, who is now probably about six weeks old, he knew that God's promise had been kept or fulfilled. Here in his arms was Emmanuel, God with us. Who is going to make everything right? Who is going to provide significance by his presence? Who is going to eliminate rejection and fear and loneliness? <clears throat> Tell you what, I think that sparked a great deal of jubilation, don't you? Yeah. You see, you can't read verses 29 and 32 in a monotone. Right. 
He, 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 didn't, he didn't just speak these words. Mm -hmm. he, he joyfully shouted these words. He, he let everyone around him know there was something going on here with this baby. Amen? Right. Verse 28 of Luke 2 says that Simeon reached down and took Jesus out of Mary's arms and he began to praise God. Bless God. Let me pause to make a comment, parents. How would you feel if some old man came up to you and grabbed your baby? <laughs> Tell you what, that'd that make the, the 10 o'clock news, wouldn't it, all right? Or what, 11 o'clock news, I don't know. Uh, and then start singing out loud to that baby. <laughs> I'm sure that would have been a bit unsettling to Joseph and Mary, too, don't you think? But Simeon didn't look all that dangerous, apparently. And, and as he broke out into praise, he, he simply acknowledged what Mary already knew in her heart. What Joseph already had been told by the angel, this baby was special. There was something about him that was, that was different. And, and here's this man who's acknowledging that and fulfilling it. And he's, and he's saying out loud, Lord, let me die now because I, mine eyes have seen your salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people and a light to lighten the Gentiles. By the way, that word means to, uh, to bring uh, revelation to the Gentiles and a glory to all of Israel. He knew this was the one. Constant. He's going to bring consolation. By the way, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 16 says this in the New Testament. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation Amen. and good hope through grace, may he comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Wow. Jesus came to bring you comfort. He came to bring you hope. He came to, to meet your needs, my friend. If you know him, he will do that. Great things come to those who wait. What about Anna? What was she waiting for? What was she waiting for? Well, when, when she comes along, by the way, it says, and she coming in verse 38, uh, we're told about her a little bit uh, there in the previous verses uh, about who she was. She was a prophetess. She had been known to speak out for the Lord and, and share uh, good news in the past. And she had lived, uh, she was now 84 years old, I believe it tells us there. Her husband had apparently died early on. Uh, she'd been married seven years. He passed away. And for those many, many years now, she had constantly, consistently continued to serve the Lord. Night and day, it says in the temple, she was. Uh, I mean, she had given herself wholeheartedly to God, but she had been waiting and waiting and waiting year after year after year after year. I remember praying for my mom and dad to get right with God and get back in church many years ago. I'd gotten saved and uh, started uh, going to church. God called me to preach, and, and uh, you know, I was going to go to Bible college. And I started praying for my parents because they weren't in church and hadn't been for many years since I was a baby. And they both had been saved early on uh, as a young adults, but they were, they were way backslidden. I mean, way backslidden. So I began to pray for them. And, you know, it took about, I don't know, 25 years or so of prayer. <laughs> praying for my mom and dad before they ever got back in church and got right with God. Long time to wait, amen? If this woman had been waiting maybe 80 some years, I don't know. She'd been waiting a really long time for this, for this Messiah to come. And, and the Bible says there in verse number 38, is she coming in that instant? Now some would call that a coincidence, right? She just happened to show up same time that Simeon did at the temple. So at the same time Jesus and Mary and Joseph are all there. And, you know, things just kind of come together. By the way, that's providence, not coincidence. Right. Right. Amen? Amen. And, and she comes in that instant, it says, and she begins to give thanks likewise, verse 38 says, unto the Lord and spake of him to all of them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. She starts preaching about the baby while she, when she sees him. In the temple. And she gets a little excited. Notice it says that she, all of those who looked for what? Looked for redemption. Looked for redemption. 
She was waiting for, for redemption, for salvation. Now she was looking forward to the same person as Simeon was, but for a different orientation, a different focus. Instead of looking for comfort, Anna was looking for forgiveness. The word redemption is related to the idea of being released from captivity. The Old Testament Passover and the release of Israel from Egypt uh, from Egyptian slavery stood in Anna's day as the ultimate story of redemption and the symbol of God's power to release captives. And ultimately, Passover pointed ahead to that day when God would provide deliverance from the penalty and the power of sin in our lives. Right. Ephesians 1.7 says about Jesus in, him, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Our redemption, you see, comes through a little baby. <laughs> What's his name? Jesus. Jesus. He's the Redeemer. The Emmanuel, God with us. And when Anna saw Jesus, first she gave thanks to God for him. And then she spoke of, of him to all who were waiting to, for re that redemption to come. And here at last was the one who would save his people from their sins. Listen, folks, Jesus provided just what Anna needed. He provided just what Simeon needed. And he's provided exactly what you need, too. God's comfort. God's forgiveness. Can I ask you again, what are you waiting for this Christmas? What are you waiting for? for to change in your life? What are you waiting for to happen in your life? Can I tell you God wants to change you today? God wants to save you today. God wants to provide forgiveness of your sins. He wants to bring comfort in, into your life, into your heart. Can you identify with Simeon this morning? See, some are really hurting. they feeling lonely, empty, afraid, stressed out. You need comfort. You need consolation. Uh, you, you need a fresh sense of God's presence. And if so, I believe you can find what you're waiting for in Jesus Christ. Amen. He came to console us right where we're at. That's right. Or perhaps you identify more with Anna. Maybe you're plagued with guilt this Christmas because of something you've done or the way you've lived your life. Do you feel like you're trapped in a pattern of sin that you can't break out of? If you need forgiveness, God or Jesus can provide it for you today. He can and will set you free from the bondage of sin. And I can think of no better time than at the Christmas season to make that decision for Jesus Christ. How about you? Now, there are certain action steps that I just want to share with you today or challenge you with today that I gained from this story. First of all, I think from this story we can, we can be taught that we need to become marvelers. I made up that word, marveler. <laughs> it, it comes from verse 33. Look at verse 33. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Uh, according to the dictionary, uh, to, be a, uh, to become a marveler is to be filled with wonder, to be filled with, with astonishment, to be filled with surprise, to, as we say, to, to regain the wonder of it all, you know, of, of who Jesus was and what he, what he came to do and what he accomplished here. And I hope want you and, I, and God wants you and I to become marvelers during the Christmas season. Oh, uh, maybe we get caught up uh, too much in the busyness of the season or we get too stressed out about all of the things we have to do and we run around during the holidays from one place to the other, but are we taking time to marvel at what God has done for us? Sometimes I think Christmas becomes a little too predictable. A little too familiar. And uh, we've heard the Christmas story so many times in our lifetime that it no longer astonishes us. It no longer brings wonder with it. But can I tell you, this story is filled with wonder. It's filled with miracles. It's filled with God. God comes to earth. <laughs> he becomes a baby. Goes to the cross and dies for our sins. He rises from the grave. He goes back to heaven. He's interceding for us there. And one day he's going to come back again to receive us to himself. That's wonder. Here, here's an idea. 
Maybe that would help you recapture some of the marvel of Christmas. Put, pick one of the Christmas characters and put yourself in their sandals for a little while. Imagine what it would have been like to witness that story firsthand. Uh, go ahead, you know, be Mary, be Joseph, be the shepherds or Simeon or Anna or the wise men and just kind of see from their viewpoint, from their eyes, what they saw. And maybe it'll spark a little bit of wonder in your heart. And God will turn you into a marveler. Amen. Number two. I think we should become a mover. A mover. Look at verse 27. It says, and he, came, and he came by the Spirit into the temple. And some translations say it this way. He was moved by the Spirit. He went into the temple courts. As he was moved by the Holy Spirit. Uh, verse 38. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord. In other words, she, she was moved by what she, she saw. That day. You see, both Simeon and, and Anna were moved by the Christmas what, they're, they're, when they saw Jesus. And, and as the Holy Spirit prompted them to speak up and, and to say something, they did. And, and, and I wonder what would have happened if they had not responded to that. Actually, every one of the Christmas characters responded to the Spirit's leading except for Herod. <laughs> 